Okay, the clock on my laptop says 7 o'clock p.m., so I'm going to have the order of this meeting of the Capitol Public City Council, and let's begin with a roll call. Council Member Bertrand. Present. Council Member Brooke. Here. Council Member Brown. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Here. Mayor Story. Here. Thank you. And if, thank you, Chloe. And at this time, if um, everyone will join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Do we have any additions or deletions to the agenda? Staff has no changes. Okay, we'll proceed as it stands then. And, um, and at this time, I think we have a very exciting presentation that's going to be given. Um, and um, who, who will be doing that? Uh, good evening, Mayor Story, Council Members. I um, have the privilege of doing a very special presentation for you this evening. Um, the city and our lifeguards had a very eventful week last week um, that started out with a beach or a boat that ended up on the beach, um, and our wonderful staff front and included and assisted in that situation. Uh, the lifeguard staff then traveled to Huntington Beach for our regionals competition along with about 47 youth. And while we were there, we had um, a very interesting incident. And I'm gonna pass it over to Brendan Howard who is going to describe to you the incident that Dane participated in. Uh, good evening, Mayor and City Council members. We had, uh, well, at the CSLSA championship for regionals, we had a banner plane that proceeded to fall from the sky and land about around 100 yards off into the ocean. There is a beach filled with over probably 150 lifeguards. And Dane, in his heroism, ran past them into the ocean and proceeded to go approach that victim in the plane, put them in, and bring them to shore safely. He passed them off to AMR and did his DDD act without hesitation and overall just shows significant heroism in general. So it's with great honor that we are presenting Dane a certificate of commendation um, for his action in rescuing the pilot um, while in his, in his, on a different beach, acting to his um, inconsistent with the character that is within the city of Capitola and a credit to his own um, quick response in order to perform this rescue. So we offer this certificate. So thank you. Yes, that's wonderful. Congratulations. Um, Thanks, Dane. Yeah, do um, council members have uh, any comments? Um, yeah, I, I do. Yeah, go ahead, uh, council member. I, I, I saw someone's, um, uh, I guess, a phone video or whatever of that. And, you know, I think everyone was so like, completely astonished, but they failed to realize that someone was going into the water in a plane and you did not hesitate. So that is totally amazing. And um, everyone else on the beach apparently was just looking up in the sky and not paying attention to the reality that was actually unfolding in front of them. So thank you very much for representing Capitola and just showing your best. And uh, good luck in your life. Yeah, and um, 
also uh, well, uh, Lyndon uh, and Dane, thanks for being here and sharing your stories with us, both about the, the boat that was, um, you know, uh, on the beach. Um, and, um, and Dane, I also, I also watched that video. Um, and the thing that is striking that it is so shocking and out of what you would normally expect. Um, and I think that, yeah, we, most of us would probably tend to freeze under that circumstance, but I think you demonstrated such a presence of mind and courage um, to know uh, what to do in that situation. Um, so I commend you on that. Um, and I think it's a reminder for all of us that sometimes life throws curveballs at us and we all, always need to be alert, always need to um, be prepared. Um, so I commend you on your, you know, your action um, and again, your courage and you really do, um, you know, um, make us proud of our capital lifeguard. So excellent work. Um, and I'm sure you will have that video for the rest of your life. <laughs> so, is there, um, um, did you want to uh, say anything, Dane? Uh, uh, I just want to say thank you, Mayor and Council members. Uh, it's a great honor to be receiving this. Um, it was it was a hectic scenario, but uh, shout out Central Fire. They definitely, they trained us well. Uh, they threw every scenario at us and the ones that we didn't expect. And this is one I did not expect at all. It's a once in a lifetime thing. So yeah, thank you guys so much for the honor. And it's just part of every day. Shout out Council of you guys. All right. Yes. Always something exciting. All right. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. So I have a new question. I'm sorry, Mayor. Yeah, go ahead, Councilman. Hey, um, do the kids have a little uh, nickname for you now? Oh, you've disappeared. Okay. <laughs> so let's move on now to uh, the report on closed session. Mayor and Council members, our closed session was had on the item on the agenda and uh, no action was taken. Thank you. Um, do we have any additional material for tonight's meeting? Uh, no, Mayor Story, none were received. Uh, so we'll move on now to oral communications. Um, this is the time when members of the public can address the council on either items that are on the consent agenda or items that are uh, not on tonight's agenda at all. Um, and if you would like to speak, you can raise your hand in Zoom um, or dial star nine. The moderator will give you uh, three minutes to speak. And it looks like we have one Zoom hand up. Mayor Story, we have Dave Montgomery. Yes, go ahead, Dave. Am I am I unmuted? I hope. Yes, you are unmuted now, Dave. I think go ahead. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm Dave Montgomery. I live in the Capitola Knowles uh, condominium uh, area. And first of all, I'd like to thank the mayor and the city council for giving me a few minutes to speak. I'm, I'm here to propose a temporary modification of the leash law for Monterey Park. Um, I sent a uh, very brief page and a half proposal to the city council last week. And on the advice of uh, the city clerk, Chloe Woodmancy, she suggested I come to the, the meeting and, and make some oral presentation of it. To give you a little bit of background, this all started during the final months of the COVID lockdown, say six or eight months ago, where a group of us um, completely impromptu started bringing our dogs at the early evening hours to the far corner of Monterey Park. And we would let them off the leash and play with each other for about 45 minutes tops, maybe. And we discovered the dogs really liked it. And um, kind of unexpectedly, we sort of became a, a neighborhood group. Um, we self-policed our dogs. We cleaned up after them and made sure that they never bothered any uh, other activities in the park or um, any other dogs on leashes. 
and it turns out to be a very, a very wonderful thing, actually, a sort of unexpected, you know, community-spirited, engendered, and kind of developed a sort of a neighborhood sense for us. Now, to be fair, we were warned multiple times by the, I believe, Parks and Recreation people, and on at least two occasions by the community service office officer to put our dogs back on our lease, which we did. So what I would like to propose, and again, this is all in my written communications that I sent previously, a 90-day trial period from about 5.30 to 6.30 in the evening where we uh, allow the dogs off leash in one small corner of Monterey Park and we will uh, police it for the 90 days, and if any, uh, any issues occur, we'll certainly shut it down. What I discovered after I sent my pack to the city council was there's a, a model very similar to this that's been in effect in the city of Cupertino for over three years. It's a dog off leash area in Jollyman Park over the hill, and I can send that information to the council if they'd like to take a look at it. Um, but again, I just wanted to make this proposal, and I hope the city council will look favorably upon this. And again, thank you for the time. And if there's anything I need to do regarding next steps, um, please let me know. Thank you again. Dave, before you leave, um, sure. I mean, that information concerning uh, the city of Cupertino um, and their similar um, uh, provision, could, could you send that? Um, well, I, I'll ask to send it to all council members, but I, I, I will. would like to see it. I will. Um, it's, they call it D-O-L-A, Dog Off-Leash Area, and it's ironically, it's almost identical to what we're proposing. It's a small corner of one of their public parks that their, and again, I'll send you the details, their situation is they, from one hour before sunset to an hour after sunset, they allow dogs off-leash in this area of the park. Um, and it's uh, apparently been very successful, and they've under, they had a trial period back in 2019, I believe, and I believe it's now permanent. So yes, I, as soon as we're finished the meeting, I'll send it to the uh, city council email list. Okay. Thank you. Thank and thank you for speaking out tonight. Oh, certainly. Thank you. Very welcome. Is there anyone that else that would like to? Um, Speak in public comment. Mayor Story, I don't see any other attendees with their hands raised, and we have not received any emails. Okay, I'll speak slowly before I move on to see if anyone raises their hand. And not seeing anyone, I'm going to then uh, now move us on to uh, item number seven, which are staff and city council comments. We'll start with staff comments. I believe our chief has a shoot update for us. Good evening, uh, Mayor Story and council members in the Capitola community. Um, I just wanted to put out there that this coming Tuesday is, is National Night Out. And so uh, the Police Officers Association is helping the rec department. We're going to have a little uh, set up with some sandwiches and some kid activities uh, up at Jade Street Park. This Jade Street Park is coming Tuesday between 5 and 7. So we uh, encourage anyone in the community to come out. It's always really well attended, and uh, it'll be a lot of fun. So I just wanted to put that out there this coming Tuesday from 5 to 7 at Jade Street Park. So thank you. Any other staff comments? Well, let's, we'll move on then to um, council comments. And I saw uh, Council Member Bertrand had his hand up first. I, I, you're still on mute, Council Member Bertrand. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, thank you very much uh, for letting me speak. Let's see, um, in regards to the recent um, uh, mention from the public on the uh, dog walking thing, um, I'd like to be involved in that discussion because um, I used to walk around that park. I live right across the street pretty much, and um, now I don't. So um, maybe uh, the, the solution they proposes might be uh, beneficial uh, for me and others who used to walk around the park. 
Um, also, I'd like to comment, um, I think city council has received uh, two different um, petitions of people uh, that have signed uh, about certain issues. And I'm following up on both of them. Um, each, each person that sent the petition um, to city council, um, I've talked to, and I'm trying to come up with um, things that I could, uh, I think, propose to the city, you know, for consideration for future agenda items. Um, uh, they're both uh, very, uh, let's say, um, hard to resolve. Um, there should be some finesse in how an agenda item is put before the city council to address them. And I'm trying to take that into consideration. Um, I'm also trying to take into consideration um, how the feelings of the people who submitted the petitions are at this point, and they are very important issues for them. And so I think that's very critical too. Um, maybe some of the other city council members may be already uh, thinking about addressing it before city council as an agenda item. But um, at this point, I'd like to have a few more discussions uh, to train some things to propose as an agenda item. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member Bertrand and Council Member Brown. Thank you. Um, I wanted to share, you know, as many of you know, I've been um, on the Community Action Board Board of Directors for about seven years now. Um, CAB is the county's designated community action agency with a mission to eliminate poverty and create social change through advocacy and essential services. Um, our board is an all-volunteer tripartite board of directors, meaning that one-third of the board members are low-income representatives from the regions in the county, one-third are elected officials representing local cities and the county board of supervisors, and one-third are representatives um, from diverse areas in the private sector. Um, and I wanted to share this evening that the CAB Board of Directors is act actively recruiting a few positions, uh, one of which right now is a low-income sector representative who is a resident, <laughs> excuse me, of either Live Oak, Capitola, or Soquel. Um, anyone who's interested in applying can email uh, Hannah R at cabinc.org to learn more information. Um, this low-income se uh, sector seat will need to respond to a couple questions in the two-page application for, for nomination to the board, uh, describing their qualifications or interest in becoming a low-income sector representative uh, and how they will exhibit support for the low-income community. The board terms are up to 36 months and, and board members can be reappointed or reselected for up to three consecutive terms for a total of nine years. Uh, and board members are expected to participate in board committees and, and help support the advancement and fund development of the agency. Uh, as I said, I've been with this organization for seven years, fantastic um, organization that runs multiple programs throughout the county. Um, so if anyone is interested, please check out, again, the, the website is cabinc.org uh, for additional information if anyone is interested in applying for that board seat. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Brown. Any other? Uh, Councilmember Kaiser, Vice Mayor Kaiser, excuse me. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, I just wanted to make a shout out to um, our awesome city that we live in. We had work to work on Sunday and it was super fun. It was our first one back in two years and um, I ran it virtually myself for a couple of years and then I was uh, participating this year and it just was really great to have um, some cheer, cheer along the lines. <laughs> it's way different running that way than not and just a huge thank you to our PD and to our staff for making um, all, all the logistics happen and making it safe and maintaining what, what the work to work is for us. And it was the 50th anniversary. And so I just want to celebrate that and give a huge shout out and a huge thank you to everybody involved. So much appreciated. Thank you, Vice Mayor Kaiser. And good job running the work to work. Um, any other council members have comments? Um, council member Bertrand, your hand is up again, or? I, I couldn't help but re resist, but um, I guess, Margo, you may not have won the race. You may not have run as fast as you could have possibly to win it, but Kristen was the one that gave out the awards for the fastest race. So thank you, Kristen, for representing Capitola. Yes, thank you, Kristen. 
I was happy to be there on behalf of Mayor Story and, and all of us uh, on the council. Um, it was nice to, to be there that morning. Yes, yes. Thank you for filling in for me. Um, well, seeing no other council members with comments, um, I have a, a couple of comments. I wanted the one um, report back to the uh, council and the public on the last Arts Commission meeting which happened on July the 12th, and just um, focusing on some of the public art um, projects that the commission has um, on its agenda. Um, one, um, the stump project, we call it, from the fallen tree and the large stump that's in the lower parking lot, um, we have continued to call the artists um, for that project, and we'll still be um, looking for um, ideas and uh, proposals from artists of, of how we could um, you know, beautify that parking lot. Uh, we also discussed um, developing a call to artists for um, a project for the Monterey um, Avenue handrail, um, you know, the one that goes up Monterey Avenue uh, from the village um, up to uh, Escalona. Um, and then, um, and third, uh, we discussed um, having a Bedonia commemorative uh, public art um, there uh, just on the other side of the Stockton um, um, Bridge. Um, and um, so, um, yeah, continue to look out for those uh, art projects um, as they should be uh, actually coming to fruition. Um, and um, and I think, on a, also on a personal note, I think many of you may already know this, but I wanted to publicly announce, um, you know, my term is ending. I would be up for re-election, but for personal reasons, I've decided not to run for re-election um, in this next cycle. Um, uh, and um, I do want to encourage, um, you know, anyone who has ever thought or is interested in running for Capitola City Council, um, that you, um, you know, look at this and um, uh, this is now your opportunity to maybe um, run for this position. It's very re rewarding. Um, and if you're interested, just uh, contact uh, uh, our city clerk, Chloe Woodman, and, uh, and she can give you all the details and things that you need to do. Um, so with that, let's um, continue on with the business of the evening. And the next is um, our consent items. Um, these are items that will be handled with uh, one vote, um, unless uh, a council member um, selects uh, one to be taken off for further discussion. Are there any uh, items that the council would like to um, uh, move off the consent agenda? Seeing none, I'll um, entertain a motion to um, approve the consent agenda. Yes, Councilmember Brooks. I move to approve the consent agenda. And second that. Okay. There's a motion by Councilmember Brooks and a second by Vice Mayor Kaiser. So we have a roll call vote, please. Councilmember Bertrand. I approve. Councilmember Brooks. Aye. Councilmember Brown. Aye. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Mayor Story. Aye. And the consent uh, items passed unanimously, which brings us to general government public hearings for the evening. Uh, the first is item A, which is a review of the Richmond Mansion Park project and consider authorizing advertising for bids. The recommended action is to approve plans, specifications, and budgets for construction of the Richmond Mansion Park, authorize advertising the project to receive bids, setting the opening date for September 7, 2022, and approve the proposed resolution amending the budget by transferring 30000 from the general fund to the Richmond Mansion Park project. We have a 
staff report, please. Thank you. Good evening, Nurse Story and Council. I'm very excited to uh, finally bring this project to this stage. This is a very long project that's gone through lots of ups and downs, and uh, we're finally getting it out. We're all quite excited. I'm going to try and uh, share my screen here if I can. Mr. Moderator, does that look okay? Council, does it look okay? It's upside down. Yeah, it's oh. upside down, Steve. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I don't know what happened. How do you even do that? I know what that is. That's impressive. Anyway, let me try again. I apologize. Actually, that's not any better, is it? Well, that's even worse, Steve. What's going on? I'm sorry, Council. I'm just having one of those days. Let me try again. I'm really sorry about this. Here we go. One more time. There we go. So, Larry, this question is for you. Does that look okay? Um, it's a golf course, so it looks great to me. How about that, Larry? Uh, no, that's that's the back, yes, your background. That also looks great. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mary Council, um, I'd like to ask for your indulgence. If I, as we all know, this is uh, the assistant to the city manager, Larry's last council meeting before he retires next week. And uh, the city manager and other department heads have gotten together, and um, we have a few pictures to share with you tonight as part of this item. First item is a uh, picture is a, a baseball game that Larry and I went to with Ed Morrison. And uh, all I can say is it was a great, it was a lousy game, but we made it home safe. Oops, one too many. So, uh, Mayor, council members, this is a day that Larry took a visit to recreation and learned that they just don't make bows his size. <laughs> All right. Mayor and Council, this is our favorite day at City Hall when Mama Duck and her baby meet across the road and take them to, to their safety. Thank you, Larry, for everything you do, especially supporting the arts. And Larry, as uh, Donnie would say, you are the walrus. <laughs> and Larry, you know, quite honestly, you're always someone that we could definitely count on. Uh, and so on behalf of the entire Capitol Police Department, thank you for everything you've done and happy retirement. And Larry, I just want to thank you. You've been such a great member of the team. You get the glue that holds us all together. Uh, even if you are always the tallest one and in the back row. So thank you and enjoy retirement. Congratulations. So we'd all like to say cheers, Larry. Cheers, Larry. Cheers. Cheers, cheers Larry. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for everything. <laughs> thank you, Mayor. Um, hey, well, the, before you proceed, okay. I just wanted to, uh, do the council members um, want to chime in uh, on that little staff presentation that we just received? Yes, Council Member Brooks. Thank you, Mayor Story. Larry, you'll get a kick out of this. When I first started um, getting to know staff, I seriously thought you were Jamie. I would see you at the beach and the national night out and everywhere in Capitola. And as I was getting early on getting to know everyone, I'm like, he must be the city manager. He must be the guy He's everywhere. And even to just recently, you have shown up to all of the events, really solidifying your uh, the city's presence in the community. And I greatly appreciate everything you've done, just not for, for our staff, but for our entire city of Capitola. And 
uh, and, and me and being there to answer questions and just someone I can lean on when I needed help. So thank you so much. Congratulations on your retirement. And I wish you the best on your new adventure. Thank you very much. Council Member Brown. Thank you, Larry. As I, I mentioned in an email I sent you earlier this week, we have all been so very fortunate to work with you and your presence at City Hall and here on the council meetings will be so sorely missed. Um, every time I've ever run into you, be it at the beginning of a meeting or just on the street or whatever it was, you've always had a kind word and you just always have such a great attitude and spirit about you. And so you will be so missed here uh, at the city. I hope that there is just nothing but relaxation and recreation in your future and um, you know that our paths will cross again soon. But congratulations. Councilmember Bertrand. Yeah, you know, so who is that guy that has that office that's not in the regular offices? I mean, you know, where do I have to go? Down the stairway? Uh, oh, no, I'm supposed to take the elevator to get there. No, I don't even elevate. We actually have an elevator here in Capitola City Hall. Oh, that guy, the one that could tell me how to turn my computer on. <laughs> Larry. I am on, I, I'm just on believing in, in how much you've done for the city. And you came in here, it's, some, it's almost like you snuck in and made sure everyone's computer worked and we could log on when something, uh, I remember how many times I logged on with the wrong name three times in a row and I'd have to come to you, Jesus Christ. So um, I think the city's gonna have to go on vacation for a while because what are we gonna do now? <laughs> All the things you've accomplished for us. Um, the one that I'm really happy about, um, there's so many, and um, you know, Kristen mentioned tons of them, and Yvette mentioned tons of them, but your care uh, for junior guards, and you know, you worked your butt off to keep that alive, and it was, I know, very hard for you. It was hard for the city. I mean, it was a lot of people who put in on that, but I, I saw you tearing your hair out on that. And you know, junior guards is one of the most important things for the youth in this city and the parents that have the youth. So uh, my heartfelt thanks for uh, thank you for that. And sail off and enjoy enjoy your life. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Kaiser. Thank you. Yeah, Larry. I just want to reiterate. I I know you're. Uh, integral part in our city and I know I've only been here for a short amount of time compared to everybody else on this board and even the first day I came in to sign papers you you were there and and you didn't make me feel like an idiot which <laughs> I was coming into it like not knowing anything and it, it was just very comforting and I know you will be sorely missed and you're always there to, to help and I'm just I'm really excited for you to, to move on and even though we'll miss you, you, you deserve all the best. So thank you so much for everything. Thank you. You know, Larry, I, I just have to say, um, you know, you have been with us and have guided the city of Capitola through uh, floods and fires and pestilence in the form of a pandemic, you know, and during that pandemic over the last two years, you were the keystone that really kept us connected to the residents and, you know, and to the public. Um, you know, we couldn't have done it without you. Um, and um, so, you know, my great gratitude uh, just for that role and your IT expertise. Um, you always seem to know exactly what the issue is and, and come up with a quick solution. Um, but aside from that, you know, I, I think I, I know you best from all the years that we worked on the um, Arts Commission together. Um, you know, and I think it's fitting that with this, you know, at the time of your retirement, that the Arts Commission report is part of our consent agenda because all those things that are listed in there are really a, a tribute to you. You really made them happen um, uh, because you carried them out. Um, and things such as the Twilight Concerts, uh, which the community just loved, uh, the Sunday Art in the Park, the Plein Air, 
um, and you know numerous public art projects. Um, those could not have happened, you know, without your assistance and your guidance. I always thought of you as the tenth art commissioner. Um, so um, thank you for that. Um, and so I just want to, as the mayor of Capitola, and more importantly, as just a resident of Capitola, thanks for everything you've done to make our city just a better place to live in. And um, and I hope that whatever your next chapter is that it's full and rewarding um, um, and, and you have a fantastic time. So, and, but we hope to still see you in Gapsola. Uh, so, thank you. Thank you very much, yeah. for all the kind words, but I really, uh, I've enjoyed my time here quite a bit. And it's, I, I'm not quite used to the word retirement. It's just kind of the next phase, but uh, um, uh, you'll see me around. <laughs> Good. I, yeah. I, I I may not live in Capitola, but I, I you know it's, it it is part of my home. So um, I really appreciate all the all the nice words, and I I had a, I, I yeah. enjoyed my time here. Otherwise, I yeah. wouldn't sit here as long as I'm here. Very much. Okay. Well, Steve, do you think you got your? Um... Well, I seem to have failed the PowerPoint, so I'm actually going to ask uh, our project manager, Kailash Zunder, to. Uh, provide the, uh, the next part of the report. Josh? Great, thank you, Steve. Here's, I'm gonna to try to share my screen, hopefully this works a little bit better. How does that look? That looks great. Okay, great. All right, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I'm happy to be here. Steve already introduced it, but happy to be here to bring uh, another public works project to you. Um, this one is the park at Riskin Mansion. Uh, for the purposes of this uh, presentation and for the bid packet, um, that's what we're referencing this project as is the park at Riskin Mansion. Um, and we're just going to keep it at that for now. If so there's more dialogue about that after this project is underway, then we can go that way. But for now, that's where we're at. So. Um, First off, looking at the, the picture that we have here is an aerial view looking south at the historic Christian Mansion and the grounds around it. Uh, the, the nature of our project is really just focusing on the grounds surrounding it. So coming across the library, from the library, crossing Wharf Road, and then entering uh, into the, the grounds. Um, the first thing I'd like to do, uh, thank the design team. This has been a long project in the making. There's been a lot of patience, a lot of back and forth, and just a lot of collaboration, both with public workshops and, and these, these uh, members of the design team have been with us the entire time and we wouldn't be here without all their hard work. So I want to thank them first off. Uh, so going over quickly what tonight's goals are, we'll go quick, uh, shortly through some project background, um, highlight a few of the steps that have already been completed um, talk a little bit about some of the key project features, and then I'll go into uh, what Mayor uh, Story uh, talked about with the, um, improving the plans to advertise this project for bid. So first off, we have another uh, view looking at the property from the west, um, and an aerial, historic aerial view there where we still have Wharf Road and Clare Street, but not much else developed out there at the time and um, hoping to bring back some of the beauty that was uh, part of this historic property in Capitola. Uh, a, a quick background, uh, there was, there's more to this history of the Riston Mansion and, and there was, uh, I think it was last year where we had the, the uh, museum had a 100 year anniversary of the, of the Riston. And so there's quite a large amount of detail if anyone's interested in looking into more um, to go back to that. And then in addition, if um, anyone's interested, council members or members of the public, in, in more detail on the, you know, the specific aspects of all the different uh, portions of this park project, um, going back to the February 11th, 2021 presentation where uh, Mike Arnone presented all the specific features of the project, um, it goes into much more detail than I'm going to go in tonight. Um, so looking at this, this these bullet points here. The main thing that happened after um, a lot of different discussions about what to do with the land is that in 2014, the city council 
voted to pursue the development of just the park project for the grounds surrounding the mansion, the mansion and to keep the mansion closed at that time. Um, subsequent to that, then there were workshops held both in 2015 and then again in 2020 and 21. Uh, we, we've got a lot of public input on different aspects of the project and we're able to incorporate a lot of the input that we received over those years into the plans that we're bringing to you here tonight. Uh, the first phase of the project that has been completed was uh, the installation of, of a portion of the ADA walkways, and I'll have a couple slides in a, in a minute to show you those. So with the final design plans completed, um, this is a plan view of the whole project with some, some nice color uh, components to, to highlight what it, it, you know, kind of the rendering of what it will look like from, the, from above. Um, some of the main standout features that I think will be really neat for people to see once we're done with the project are the, the amphitheater, which is located down at the lower level that goes down the grand staircase uh, down to the amphitheater, which then overlooks the uh, so-called creek. And it's a really nice view from down there. For, if you haven't had the opportunity, I think once this is complete, that'll be a really nice place for people to sit and view and just congregate. Um, above the, uh, walking up from the, the Amphitheater, you go up the grand staircase to the reflecting pool. Um, that pool itself historically was a, was a fountain. Um, we will be restoring the fountain, but the, the reflecting pool itself will just be restored structurally, but it won't be having standing water in at the time. Uh, then kind of going across and looking at my screen, my background right now is kind of the landscape of what we, we have right now out there. And what will be, will be uh, lots of uh, garden plantings, uh, historically, there was a sundial, there'll be a bocce ball court, and then at the far end, there'll be a big, a, a large arbor um, with a trellis and, and other garden plantings around that. Uh, in addition to that, there'll be a few overlooked areas that kind of look down, because uh, this, this portion of the property is a little bit elevated, so it does give you a vantage point looking down towards the mansion and the creek. Um, and there will also be a children's uh, play area in that section of the, of the park. So uh, what we have completed to date are the two portions of the, uh, the walkway that get you to the mansion. So uh, on the bottom left are the, is the ADA pathway that takes you from Wharf Road immediately across the street of the library and takes you down to the, the upper level of the park. And that was completed in 2016 and is, is actively used on a daily basis by people now. And then the other view on the top right is the walkway that you get to when you cross from the Nogville Shopping Center over Perry Park Bridge, and then you come up the walkway, there's both the, the pedestrian pathway, which is um, the, the one that has the concrete surface that has the handrails on both sides, and then the bike pathway on the opposite side with the asphalt surface. Um, so those two have been completed, and then once the, once the project gets fully completed, there'll be another ADA pathway that takes you down to the mansion level, and I'll highlight that in a moment. Uh, here we go. So here's the accessible path of travel. So what I was talk, speaking to there are the two red areas. So that brings you in from Wharf Road. You can walk down the red path, and the upper area is fairly level. Takes you down to the, a couple turns that takes you down towards the connection to the Perry Park Bridge. But uh, what we will have now that's not currently open and it's uh, blocked by chain link fence. The blue pathway here is what will then allow, um, you know, people pushing strollers or, you know, needing to use wheelchairs or whatever it might be. Uh, you can get down to the, the lower level, which will take you down to the mansion level and to the bottom there, the amphitheater and the grand staircase. And I think, um, you know, I'm maybe partial that I think some of the best walks we've got in town are walking through the Prairie Park area and walking to the end of the wharf. And I think this will enhance this walk even more for anyone who wants to stroll through this portion of town. Um, so quickly, I want to just highlight uh, some of the main historic features that are going to be rest restored. So in addition to um, refurbishing what was historically there and trying to capture some of the uh, period pieces as far as the plantings and, and just the way the gardens were, um, some of the, the old uh, portions of like the uh, fountain and the walls and the staircase are all going to be refurbished to, you know, to match as close as they can to what the historic building was like. And then in addition to the historic features, there will be new park features that kind of uh, complement some of these, these 
pieces that were there previously. So here's a, a nice uh, picture showing you the historic look of what the grand staircase looked like there. Uh, the current version of, of uh, has its state a little bit overgrown. And then the design plans for, you know, for what the, uh, the team that gets selected to do the project will, will use to drive what they're uh, recreating for us here. Um, the new park elements are, are things such as lighting, um, the amphitheater, the bocce ball court, the uh, play area, and just you know, just making it more of a little bit more of a modern, more modern park with uh, water fountains and bike racks and things of that nature that just make it a little bit easier for everyone to enjoy the park. The amphitheater is something that we're very excited about. This is going to be located um, so in, that, in the color picture on the right, kind of the, the grassy hillside, that area there is what's going to get filled in with the amphitheater. Um, and it'll provide a nice venue for, you know, congregating maybe events. I, you know, we're, I guess we'll see what we end up having here, but I think it's going to be a really nice uh, platform for those people to use for years to come. And some of the other new elements that are coming in are the, the fencing, the which is shown in red. So there'll be new fencing along the Fort Worth, Wharf Road frontage, and then wrapping around the reflecting pool and down towards um, the the mansion itself. Those there there are gates on those, and those will be open sunrise to sunset, just like the rest of our other parks in town. Um, the purple area that is highlighted on the frontage of Wharf Road. Um, it may or may not be something that you notice right now when you drive by, but there's a really nice wall that's there. But because of the height of the wall, um, it precludes people from being able to see into the park. And so one of the comments and one of the goals of the project was to be able to make it a little bit more visible, both for people to know that it's there and just, you know, just brightening it up a little bit. So the plan is to cut down a portion of that wall and put in wrought iron fencing instead so there's more light that goes through it's more visible and so the the image on the bottom half is is the is looking at that purple wall um, section there and so there'll be an entrance work from the new library and the crosswalks playing across from the library and then you'll enter there uh, at the existing ada ramp and then that's where you'll you'll have access to the whole park and then the lighting we have a number of new lights that will go in because um, one, one comment that we had from quite a few folks when we had our public workshops was that there was a concern about making sure that it was, you know, it felt safe for people to walk through, um, understanding that, you know, although the park, some of the park may be closed, it's still a path a lot of people use, you know, day and night. And so we wanted to be able to provide that. So there'll be that lighting um, features there. Um, the planting plan. So this is something, again, that we got a lot of nice input from our workshops. Um, a few people highlighted some of the historic plantings that had been known to be in this area. And so uh, working with our landscape architect, Mike Arnell, we were able to uh, kind of pick and choose some of the, the things that were selected. And then all with the native plantings from just kind of native California plants. And then as well as complementing that with some of the, the historic violet plantings that are known to have been used during I think the period when the when the nuns occupied the property, um, and then in addition, because the property is right next to a um, uh, known area for monarch butterflies, there's going to be a number of areas where nectar sources for monarchs will be. So I think during the springtime that'll be a nice place to, you know, view birds and butterflies and just have have a nice stroll through the park. Uh, there are a few future park elements that haven't fully been flushed out. Most of these are being, uh, will probably be worked on with the, uh, the Arts Commission. Um, the first one that I wanted to highlight were the informational signs. So there's, we have five locations selected for signage. Um, two of those are on pedestals. So the, the project will build the pedestal, but we, um, we're, we're in, the, in the works of de determining what the information and what those actual signs will be. Um, so those are those are things that have that aren't fully completed at this point, but will be will be completed soon after the project is, is constructed. Um, one other idea that was you know part of the, the project from a, a long time back was having the idea of having some mural locations. So um, the idea there would be that you know there's these the the little red sections on the mansion themselves are where there's existing windows that have been walled in. And the idea there would be to 
add some life to the building and put some kind of living looking murals with, you know, either scenes of music being played or, you know, ballroom dining or dancing and things of that nature. So there's a lot of different ideas out there. And this is something that um, the idea is to work with the Arts Commission and um, make some decisions on what we may or may not want to put on these areas. But these are the areas that have been highlighted as potential locations for, for murals. Um, and, and that's another uh, portion of the project that will have to be completed uh, after the construction is done in, in coordination with the Arts Commission. Here's a few of the concepts for what had been uh, talked about during um, previous workshops and, and in, in brainstorming what might be uh, appropriate in these locations. And then the last thing that I think I spoke to at the beginning was the reflecting pool. So the pool itself, everything will be refurbished. Um, and, it, you know, we may decide that that's the state that it should stay in, but it's also an opportunity to potentially, you know, put a sculpture, um, some prominent person from Capitola or, you know, something that looks like a living or, you know, active water feature, um, and then some mosaic tile down on the bottom of the, of the reflecting pool. Um, that, that's also another piece that's to be determined and, and may or may not be something that we go after right away, but it, the, the, uh, I guess the canvas will be there for, for the future. And so getting into the, the uh, details here, so funding for this project, um, we have a few funding sources. Uh, we were awarded a state parks grant um, in 2020 or 21 um, for just around $178,000. Um, there have been quite a number of general fund allocations over the years, um, up to the amount of about 756000 And right now, uh, based off of our, our most you know, accurate estimate that we were able to come up with, um, this is a little bit of an interesting project to, to estimate prices, but I, we're, we're as confident as we've been in, in, in here and now that this is what we think the budget should be for the project. Um, and with that, that's why we do have a proposed budget amendment of $30,000 to bring us to the total uh, expected project cost of $964,000. Um, so the plan, if, if approved tonight, the plan would be to take this project, advertise for bid starting as soon as we can, and then have bid opening in the month of September with the contract award then the month of October and then construction to start this coming spring. And I think with that, um, I've put up the recommended actions and I'm happy to take any questions or comments from the council. Yes, Council Member Brown. Thank you. I'm just curious, it said construction would start in, in uh, spring of next year. How long do we anticipate it's going to take? So this is a project, I think we're, we're anticipating this being done before the fall if we start in the spring. Great, thank you. Any other questions from council members on the project? Seeing none, I'm gonna go after the public. Oh, hold on, uh, council member Big France. Uh, thank you, Mary. Um, so as we know, we have an agreement um, in terms of conservation area and how we um, do projects that may affect that. Um, have you worked with the lawyer or lawyers that are representing that group? Yeah, the project limits do, don't overlap with the conservation easement, so we don't have any conflict with the with the requirements to follow those guidelines. So I don't. Yeah, that, that's been that's been vetted. Okay, and the, um, the theater or the arena, uh, not the theater, the, the Greek theater, I guess, didn't that overlap a little bit? I don't think so. I think if you, yeah, Steve may be able to speak to this, but I'm, I don't think we overlap with the conservation even as far as the allowable, the allowable uh, development. We're within our allowable development footprint. Okay, thank you, Kila. So, so Councilman Bertrand, you're correct. Part of the amphitheater crosses the line. We did work with the uh, attorney on the project and, and made a, a swap of areas, um, added some more conservation area, and to allow the uh, uh, amphitheater to go in. So that part of it we have taken care of. Okay. Yeah, I was wondering what the resolution, because I heard there was an issue. Thanks very much, Steve.
further questions from council members? Seeing none, I'm going to see if there's any member of the public that would like to comment on this item. Mayor Story, I do not see any attendees with hands raised, and I do not see any emails on this item. Okay, seeing no public comment, I will bring it back to the council for further deliberation and uh, hopefully action on the recommended um, item. Um, any council members that would like to start with comments? Yes, council member Brooks. I have no comments, but I'd like to move the following recommended actions. Um, item one, two, and three as seen on the screen here, approve the plans specifications and budget for construction of the park at Risbon Mansion and authorize advertising the project to receive bid setting in oh come on I was reading off the screen guys <laughs> Larry <laughs> there we go. opening date for September 7th and number three approve a budget amendment transferring 30,000 from the general fund to the park at um, the Risbon Mansion project I'll second okay. oh, okay. We have a motion by Councilmember Brooks and it's been seconded by Councilmember Bertrand. And before we call for a vote, I just want to express how pleased I am um, after all these many years that we're finally going to um, see this project completed uh, within the next year. Um, I think it's going to be a fabulous resource for the city and particularly the location across the street from our new library. Um, I think it will be a fantastic asset um, for the residents of Capitola. With that, can we have a roll call vote? Councilmember Bertrand. I agree. Councilmember Brooks. Aye. Councilmember Brown. Aye. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Aye. And Mayor Story. An enthusiastic guy. Thank you. Um, that motion passes unanimously, which will bring us to the next item 9B, um, which is to dis discuss potential content for a hybrid meeting administrative uh, policy. Uh, the recommended action is to provide direction to set to assist in drafting a hybrid meeting policy for council adoption at the August 25th meeting or determine no policy is needed. Can we have a staff um, presentation? Yes. Hi, Mayor Story. That I will be presenting, and I'm going to ask moderator Larry for the last time if he could uh, let my video turn on, first of all. And secondly, I'll ask him about my screen. Um, okay. Here I am. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. And one moment, thank you for your patience. Are you seeing the slide? It looks good. Okay, great, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Mayor and Council for your patience. I will be presenting briefly on a potential hybrid meeting administrative policy. And as I'm sure you recall, we, um, are currently operating under Assembly Bill 361. Uh, there are some requirements under that bill, such as adopting findings every 30 days to allow us to hold these 100% virtual meetings. Uh, you did adopt such findings uh, during the consent calendar this evening. And earlier um, in June, Council did direct staff to prepare for hybrid meetings, which would allow for the public to attend in person, as well as virtually starting with the August 25th regularly scheduled council meeting, and to also um, have staff research some policies around the idea of that type of a hybrid meeting. And so I did, in fact, do the research as requested. And uh, to be honest, there are not a lot of city admin policies out there about this type of a meeting. Um, they're pretty new, and it seems like, generally speaking, city staff is kind of figuring it out and you know, moving forward, but hasn't put much into writing yet. I did find the town of Los Gatos, so a nearby um, town, 
did just amend their regular meeting policy with some stipulations for remote attendance of council members. In that example, they added um, guidelines that limited remote attendance for individual council members no more than two times in a row and um, why a council member might attend in that way. So in, in this example, they needed a council member to either be ill or be away from the area due to business or council business and that um, they really wanted to have a quorum of council members present in the town for meetings. So that's just an example of what a somewhat um, local area has done. Uh, moving on from that, just kind of a reminder. So um, the hybrid meeting idea, again, that you were um, suggesting for August 25th would be for members of the public, uh, not much will really change. If those choose to attend um, using Zoom, they can the same way that we've been doing now for more than two years, or uh, they will be able to come in person as you know everyone did pre-2020, pretty much the same as you know back to usual. So that is kind of the idea is public can decide how they'd like to attend based on their comfort level, and we could implement some safety precautions um, as we go. For council, it, it's a similar idea, but it's a little different based on our broadcasting and our technology. So if council members choose to attend remotely with some members of council here in the room, the, the visuals might be a little different. So those attending from home won't necessarily be seeing each individual staff member and each council member as you're used to now with Zoom. It would be more of a full room view I keep calling it like the C-SPAN view of just kind of the room at large. So just something to consider. And then of course with council attending remotely, we would continue following the Assembly Bill 361 requirements, which we've been doing now, not an issue. So other changes staff suggests for having an, really anyone in the room here. Um, I am alone as I have been for a long time, but to welcome more people into the space. We suggest also having the community room open to kind of use for overflow or if people want to spread out a little bit more. And then the really the biggest change would be um, public comment and oral communications will be allowed um, as they are now verbally. So if someone is here present in the room, they could speak at the podium or um, if someone has signed in via Zoom, they could speak through the Zoom application or over the phone. However, we suggest really to kind of keep things clear to no longer accept written or email public comment. We really noticed um, it's been confusing for members of the public and for staff to explain the difference between a written public comment during the meeting versus a written public comment before the meeting and what gets read into the record and what doesn't. So we think this really will streamline that and still allow for much participation from the public, which of course is our goal. Now, all of that being said, if council decides and, and wants an administrative policy, the idea would be to discuss that this evening, share your thoughts, and staff will draft a potential policy to be brought back at the August 25th meeting for um, a approval. And we kind of outlined some ideas here for you regarding council member attendance, certainly setting in some guidelines or expectations, maybe what you would like to do, limiting how many members can attend remotely or how often, or if there's requirements around that. And then another area that you may wanna consider um, are just any kind of COVID-19 precautions. If you're interested, we could get those you know, written into an official policy, such as masking requirements, social distancing, any other kind of thoughts you may have. So that's help, hoping to help with this discussion this evening, this slide. And also just to, to note, the assembly bill does not expire until the end of 2023, as long as there's an emergency declaration by the governor in place. So there's certainly, um, it's certainly allowed for us to continue meeting as we are now, which is 100% virtual, which does allow for the, the visuals to be kind of what we're used to and what we've been doing for so long. So just wanted to throw that information out as well. And um, as a reminder, when, when this was first kind of brought up in early June, our COVID numbers were really going down and we were very excited. 
And as I'm sure we're all aware and have seen in the news and just heard anecdotally, things have kind of started to go back up again. So just wanted to put that in the presentation and it was mentioned in the staff report. So all of that being said, our recommendation this evening is for council to kind of decide whether you'd like staff to draft an admin policy and if so, provide us some direction on what you'd like the content to be or let us know if you feel that no official policy is necessary, that's absolutely up to you. So if you have any questions or you know wanting help with that discussion, just let me know. I will try to answer them. And that is the conclusion of the presentation. Thank you so much. Any council members have questions on the presentation? Yes, Council Member Brooks. Thank you, Mayor Story. Um, and I appreciate you bringing this um, forward to council. I know this has been a priority of yours to bring all of us back in person. Um, at our last meeting, there was some mention of a governor's update that the governor was going to actually release policy um, and guidance so that cities could adhere to. Um, has there, and I know Samantha, our city attorney brought this up, Samantha, do you have an update for us about where they're at with this? Sure. Thank you, Councilmember Brooks. Um, so the bill that I briefed you on previously died. Um, that was AB 1944. It died. There's another bill that's weaving its way through the state legislature that is more permissive in terms of remote meetings than the current Brown Act, meaning um, it would be easier to meet remotely, but it is not as permissive as 1944 was. And the legislature is still um, going back and forth about what amendment. That, we don't know when that will be decided upon. So the short, the long answer that I just gave you, the end of the long answer is yes, the legislature is still working on a bill that would permit remote meetings, presumably without an emergency declaration, which is um, what's required now for the um, governor to have an emergency declaration in effect. Until that time, the governor's emergency declaration is in effect, and I was just asking some of my colleagues, I have not heard anything, perhaps Clerk Chloe has, about the emergency declaration being rescinded. I have not, nor had um, some of the other city attorneys I just checked with. And as a follow-up question, if we were to create a policy um, prior to, the, to that uh, being released, does that supersede what we've already decided? Would, you know, would the governor's decision overrule what we've created? Yeah, yeah, the governor's wrong. Not so. Um, <laughs> just, just making sure. Just making sure. I mean, my guess is that the policy. So, if the council is interested in waiting until um, we get some resolution on legislation before making a policy, that's probably the most efficient thing to do. Alternatively, you could make a policy tonight consistent with AB 361 or consistent with coming back in person, whatever you choose to do. And then you might need to revise it if legislation comes out. If you choose to um, use the legislation, the legislation won't require you to meet remotely. It'll just give you that option under certain circumstances. And in, as my last question, uh, Mayor Story, is there any issue of approving a policy at the August 25th meeting while we're all in person that in regards to the hybrid? You know, like before even making those there any problem with doing something like that or and us needing to extend while well, approving it in August 25th virtually and then implementing it in the September meeting is that is there any problem with us approving it I, I guess I'm going in circles there but do you get you know what I mean like we're we're gonna meet we've decided we're gonna meet in person on August 25th and then we would be without any rules and approving a policy on August 21st in person. Is there any issue with that? 
Was that just to me? Or it's to for me? anyone who knows. Oh. I don't know. It just seems odd to me that we would be doing that. With that you know, but... I, 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 see, I, see I see what you're suggesting, uh, Mayor Brooks. It, it, it seems funny to adopt a set of rules around the meeting that you're already doing in that format when you're already yeah. doing it. But I think it's I think it's fine because, I mean, okay. at least based on what we have seen, most of these rules are kind of like, okay, what are the expectations around council member attendance? Is it okay if people zoom in every time or not? Um, and so I think it's fine to have your first meeting and then say, okay, here's going to be our rules going forward. You could even meet for three months and see, do we have any issues? But I do think that it, it, if people have specific expectations, it could be useful to put them into a policy. Um, sure. Okay, those are all my questions. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> questions from other council members? Seeing none, um, I had a question concerning uh, the votes. I, I know during Zoom we were required to do roll call votes on literally everything. Um, does that continue in the hybrid context or is that more liberal? To have the council members hybrid as we are now under AB 361, even if the <coughs> members are in person, we would still need to follow the rules of that bill. So yes, we would be doing roll call votes. And if I'm wrong, I know the attorney will correct me and that is totally fine. No, that's exactly right. Okay. It exactly. Looks like, yeah, it looks like she's agreeing with you. And thank so, you. Um, okay. Thank, thank you for answering my question. Um, are there any other questions from council members um, on the presentation? Seeing none, I think I'll, I'll go out to uh, the public and see if there's any attendees that would like to address the council on this item or, uh, or if there's any phone calls. Mayor Story, I do not see attendee, any attendees with their hands raised for this item. Uh, I do not see any emails on this item. Okay, well, I'll bring it back um, uh, for further council uh, deliberation and, uh, and decision. Uh, council Member Brown. Thank you. Uh, I just had a, a couple thoughts. Um, my first thought was about the limitation on how many members can attend remotely. I think if anything, we should also consider having limitations on how many members should be in the chambers together at the same time. I think it would be important for us to have some kind of social distancing uh, in place still. Um, I'm currently battling COVID and it's no fun. Um, and so with the, with the numbers going up again, I think it would be wise of us to have only three people at the dais where we otherwise would have had five to allow for some of that distancing. Um, you know, as far as masks go, one of the reasons that we hadn't returned to in-person earlier is that we wanted to do it at a time when the mask mandates were no longer in place. So I think that it wouldn't make a lot of sense to bring us all back wearing masks at the dais again, but it would make sense to bring three of us in um, at most um, and, and keep us socially distanced. So I think that would mean, you know, two, two members could attend remotely at any time. Um, how we would determine that I think is, is yet to be seen. Of course, in the case of an illness, um, you know, like myself would definitely not uh, need to be in person, um, or, or if someone is traveling and still willing to, to log on to the meeting, of course that would be an option. But otherwise, I think um, determining who would, would attend remotely and when is something we'd, we'd have to figure out. But I do feel strongly that we should limit the in-person uh, attendance. Um, and then also the, the seating arrangements for the public, I think we should consider every other seat uh, in, in the chambers for the same reason, for some, some social distancing. Um, and then I know that in the past, we used to have our, kind of our doors open and our windows open, but I don't know if um, city staff is considering any possibility for air purifiers or 
uh, you know, something along those lines to have in the room um, once we get more people in uh, in shared spaces like that. So those are my comments for now. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I want to piggyback on some of what Kristen said, at least about um, the distancing and the amount of um, council members in chambers at one time. Um, I, I do see the numbers rising and it does, um, it makes me leery also um, selfishly for my, my time constraints that I have within my, my workplace and I think a lot of other members have that same situation happening where it, it is hard to schedule and, and being on Zoom while people may not feel it's face to face or it's right in the forefront, um, it has allowed for a lot of flexibility within scheduling and being prompt and being present. Um, so uh, I don't know, I, and I don't think that if we do a hybrid thing, I, I don't really see either we're going to be hybrid or we're not, I don't really see there being a point to um, really limiting the hybrid option for those on council. Um, I, I'm happy to amend, amend this and, and make and allow us to continue on working virtually because of where we're at with case numbers and things like that. Um, if anybody's willing to entertain that um, so I know Jacques has his hand up. I, I want to hear him out as well. Those are just my personal comments and feelings where I'm at. Um, I, I would prefer the option to, to zoom in on the regular if possible. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mary. Um, so I just have a little input here. Um, I, I like the idea of a policy. Um, I think some other meetings are already doing that one here in uh, Capitola. But uh, let's see, I'm on the um, sanitation board and we've been doing hybrid for a long time. I suggested that they get the owl and once the owl is purchased, it works really well. So I attend because I'm the chair, uh, but no one else attends. Uh, staff is there uh, if they're making presentations um, and then others zoom in. And recently, the RTC decided to do hybrid at the county building, and the decision was to only allow five members of those who are seated on the RTC commission. And so there's plenty of room to social distance on the dais. And um, I haven't heard the rules for the, for the people attending uh, who want to speak, et cetera, but there's huge amount of space there and I'm sure there's going to be social distancing there. I just don't know them yet. So, um, you know, I think the comments that have been made uh, ahead of time are great. Um, limiting and social distancing at the dais and the staff recommending that if a lot of people come, you know, having a room off to the side and, you know, they can hear what's going on and come in when they want to uh, make their uh, comments on an item. So I think that was a great idea. Um, so, um, you know, if it comes to pass that the donor signs something, uh, as Sam said, we can make some adjustments and so it's good to know that, you know, we can sort of dovetail our, our approaches. So those are my comments and, you know, Kaiser, I think, uh, excuse me, Councilwoman Kaiser, you wanted to make a motion, I believe, and I'll just bow out now. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I think all that I said was that I am willing to make a motion to move forward virtually just based on numbers and um, other things that I brought up before, if anybody else is willing to entertain that. So, so you just want virtual non-hybrid? Oh, hy hybrid is fine. Um, I just was stating too that like it, I, I don't see putting putting a limitation necessarily on the hybrid option um, within, you know, was it Los Scottis, Chloe, that was um, like every other or only two in a row or something like that. So I think opening up those options more so for us and having a policy more geared towards flexibility 
is where I'm kind of looking at. Is that a motion or is that just directing the staff? Um, well, I would say I would make a motion to move on virtually unless we want to move hybrid but uh, not have the limitations such as stated in the early part of the presentation. Um, if other council members want to join virtually but not have a restriction as to how many in a row. Is there a second to that motion? Council Member Brooks? Um, I'm not prepared to make a second on that motion yet, but I, I just want to seek some clarification. You know, I think for the most part, we what we're all agreed upon and what we did agree upon is that we want to come back in person. We want to offer a hybrid model, and I'm 100% completely behind that. I know that our community needs a space to gather, and they want to be in person, and they want to be able to talk to somebody, and I most certainly respect that and think we need to, to offer that. Um, to, to Vice Mayor Mark uh, Kaiser's point, um, I think limit uh, – the best way I can say this is that I think every council member should be able to, at their discretion, decide whether they want to attend or not. We all have different scenarios. We all have different, you know, are more vulnerable uh, to to the to the COVID or health issues or family issues or whatever. I think every council member should most certainly have the opportunity to choose or not to choose. I think what we need tonight, um, I would suggest moving forward with continuing mm -hmm. um, with the hybrid model and at uh, no more than three council members meeting in person at one time for safety precautions. That will allow in, in terms of our chamber space for us in our seating, um, but no more than three. This might be a little bit of a nightmare for our, uh, for our, our city manager here, um, and I most certainly, I saw you turn on your camera like that. But um, <laughs> there might be a different way to, to, to say that. But what I mean is I think every council member should be able to choose right now, especially with the numbers going up. What council member Brown just said, she's ha she has it right now. Um, you know, everyone's experiencing different things. But I do want to create space for our community and our constituents to be able to come to and, and have someone there. Um, so I think any feedback before I formalize that as a motion, um, I don't know that we need to create, oh, and I don't think we need to create a policy. I think that we can just create some general governance right now until we get further um, information from the governor's office, since there's nobody else really creating these formal rules and going back and forth. I don't, um, I guess this would be a question for staff if we actually need to even create something so formally, but just for the meantime, say this is what we're gonna do. Um, I, I'm looking for an answer there. To answer that question, there is no urgent need to create a policy. I think you're perfectly fine giving us direction. Uh, Great. Based on kind of the concept you outlined, the only question I would have would be, is staff responsible for Picking, or is, is the idea that any council member can attend in person? I guess just a little bit more about what do we do if four council meeting members show up at the meeting? You know, how how would yeah, we? Yeah, no, I yeah. I don't I don't have the answer, and, and I see other hands going up. Maybe someone can make a suggestion on how we could manage that better. But I do want to give council members the opportunity to choose, you know, um, and and be able to do so. Um, Council Member Brown. Thank you. Yeah, I, I know this sounds like a um, potentially a lot of work for, for staff, but I think it would need to be a situation where perhaps the Friday when the agenda goes out, um, you know, we either city clerk or, or city staff would need to essentially reach out to the council members and say who's coming um, so that we can confirm that, you know, three people no more than three people will show up and then i guess the other question that i have is do we also have a floor of how many people would need to be there for it to be worth essentially opening city hall for if we have 
um, you know, two people that are sick and two people that want to zoom in, and then there's only one person that's that's out the dais. Is that a reason for us to open City Hall and have staff there, or would that essentially become a virtual meeting? And in that case, you know, do we get into kind of this odd situation where we're every other week trying to inform the public of whether or not City Hall will be open, or does this now mean? that there always needs to be at least one council member there and city hall will, will now always be open. I think that's something we should also clarify. Um, but I, I do agree with, with, um, with vice mayor Kaiser and councilwoman Brooks that I think it's up to each person individually to determine what they're comfortable with at, at any given time. Um, I, I personally would, you know, for the most part, and, and not knowing the circumstances of any given day, be happy to, to return as one of the three uh, if I'm not uh, ill or, or potentially been exposed to her. But I think everyone should have the opportunity to make that decision for themselves. Council Member Bertrand. Yeah, um, for the RTC, we just decided uh, through staff help who would like to do it. And um, I forgot how many saw on it, but. Um, not many people volunteered and you know so that basically it was easy to get the five um but i i agree with uh councilwoman brown that it, it could present some issues in terms of you know needing to be on the phone um it was initially accomplished with just a an email to everyone and those who were interested responded and um that's how it eventually got to five that's my only comments. Um, yeah, I, I'm strongly in support of a hybrid. Um, I don't know if we need a policy, but it does give guidance, and um, sometimes that's good. Uh, but there's a lot of people who are, you know, when I walk around, they ask me, when are we going to get back to meetings again? People want to be before us and be able to present what they um, feel on an issue. It's, it's actually very important. I mean, to some extent, we, I believe, lost a lot in those two years. I mean, there's a reason why. I'm not saying we did the wrong thing. But we did the right thing because we had to combat COVID. And um, so definitely that. But people are really wanting to speak before us. And um, that's part of our democracy to have that forum. So that's why I'm for the hybrid meeting. Thank you. Yeah, Council Member Brooks. Yeah, yeah I'd, I'd be interested in hearing Council Members' thoughts on what the county supervisors currently do. They have at least one, you know, they always have one person there on the dais. Um, and so I'm curious whether Council Members would be interested in saying at least one, no more than three until the pandemic goes away. I don't know if that's realistic, but it's never going to go away. But something of that nature. So we're kind of, it's that middle ground. Um, I don't know, thoughts on that? Well, if I may chime in uh, this time, and, um, I guess what I hear is a lot of questions and proposals and ideas being thrown out, which to me are screams for the need for a policy. Whether you say it's one or all or when and who is it, um, and uh, I think those are the subjects that are, you know, best dealt with with a policy so that the public can know what they can expect from their council members. Um, and so um, I think just to leave it open-ended um, would probably mean, uh, you know, who knows? I mean, somebody's going to, in order to make it work, yes, there would have to be a commitment that at least one council member will always be there. Um, and I, you know, since I'm the mayor, um, I would feel that it felt on my shoulders to be there. Um, and so that, you know, right, that, you know, the public can come, um, you know, and, and address that directly, but they wouldn't be, I mean, um, because um, some council members and would still be in Zoom. Um, that's why I think that would necessitate some kind of policy so that we can, uh, I think, meet the public expectations from their council members. Because as to what Josh mentioned, 
Yeah, that's what I hear from the public as well. They want to know when we're going to be back. Um, so, and to me, the only way to make that work fair and equitably is to have some established um, expectation uh, from council members. You know, the expectation used to be that you were always there at the diet um, and you always voted um, and um, and that the public can see you do that um, because um, that's what they wanted from their council members. Um, and they want to be able to talk to us in person, look us in the eye. And there's a lot that gets missed when you're on Zoom only. Um, so, um, now with all that said, I, I agree with something in the ground and because the numbers are, are high now and we don't know what they're going to be in August, I think that we do need to um, start um, with, you know, maybe just three of us and have some distancing also in the auditorium. Um, I also think it's going to be necessary to actually be back there and see how it works. I mean, I, it, I have difficulties even coming up with policies when I'm not there and I don't actually know, you know, um, how it's going to work, how the hybrid technology is. Um, I don't have any experience with it. Um, well, limited and very good. But, and so, it, you know, some of these, um, I think, guidelines are, uh, may fall into place after we have experience with it. But um, even starting out, I mean, if we're only going to have three, I think that we should at least come to some understanding of, well, how, how is the three going to be selected? Is it always going to be the same three? Or it sounds like it could be even less than three. So, um, but I'll leave that at the will of the of the, of the rest of the council members. Um, and um, I will. I mean, I I plan on being there. Um, you know, from here until the end of the year. So I'll commit to you know being there as mayor in the chamber. Um, and um, so that it can be a regular schedule of open council meetings. Um, and because I think it would be awkward, we have to agendize this, we have to let the public know whether the city hall is going to be open or not. And so um, we should just commit to that it's going to be open, uh, you know, COVID permitting. I mean, I think that's, that's granted. I think that we should direct the staff to plan for well, what happens if COVID gets worse? You know, we may need to push it back. And what metrics do we use to do that? And I've always, um, you know, we've always followed the county health protocol. Um, and I agree that if indoor mask mandates come back, we should not be going back into, you know, public meetings. And so I think at a minimum, we should let, you know, direct staff to keep watching the numbers, keep watching what public health is telling us. Um, and um, and if and it gets um, uh, you know uh, worse, that um, you know we should you know, we should probably maybe put this off further. But if the numbers improve, they they don't get worse. You know, yeah, we should um, I think come come back. Um, and but I think that ultimately I think we're going to agree that this, we're going to have to have some guidance about who's going to be there in person and who's not. Um, because I don't think it would be equitable for all the same people uh, to be there in council chambers and, um, you know, while others, you know, uh, don't. Um, so maybe that's old school on my part. Um, I've always felt that that was the role of the council member is to be there in, in person in chambers and, and be able to uh, host the public uh, and to respond to them in person, look them in the eye and make our decisions. And so, um, but, but those are my thoughts. Um, and maybe I'll turn it over now to, um, I'll go back to Council Member Brown. She's had her hand up. So. Thank you, Mayor Story. I was just going to suggest um, 
you know, you you kind of gave me the idea here because you you um, volunteered that you plan to be there at, at every meeting from here till the end of the year. And um, assuming I'm testing positive or testing negative a, a month from now and and I'm healthy, um, then I'm I'm planning to attend the August meeting in person. And so perhaps the way that we could do this is to just have a standing agenda item as the last item on every meeting to just say who's coming to the next one. And then it becomes kind of an ongoing, um, you know, just quick show of hands, more or less, of who's planning to be in person at the next meeting. And then that way, it's already part, we're already here having a discussion. Staff is already here with us. They don't have to reach out to us separately. And then, you know, unless something happens in that, that two-week time period where someone falls ill or, or is exposed or whatever the case may be, um, then it's already determined for each meeting who's going to be there um, at least two weeks in advance. So that was just my thought on that. Um, but yes, I, I do plan to be there for the August meeting, um, assuming that I'm, I, I'm, I don't end up with that long COVID and I'm, I'm testing negative a month from now. Yeah, so let's hope for that. Um, also, member Bertrand. Yeah, I was, um, in, unless um, Councilwoman um, Heiser is still planning to make a motion, um, if you weren't, then yeah, I, I would like to make one. Well, just, um, I just yeah, thanks for going back to Council um, Vice Mayor Heiser's motion. I, I feel that that motion died for the lack of a second. Um, okay. So I, the floor is open for a new motion. Okay. I, I just wanted to ask out of courtesy. So I, I just like to make a motion that um, we, we um, send these ideas back to staff to develop a, um, a protocol or a policy that we address next meeting. And um, we already decided to meet in August and I like um, uh, Councilman Brown's suggestion that um, those who want to be at that meeting uh, tell everyone now <laughs> um, or tell staff so that um, seating can be arranged. But the main thing is my motion is to have staff come back with a, a protocol or a policy and we could uh, entertain that. And the only thing about guidance there is you've heard a lot um, um, city manager Jamie Goldstein and and there's a lot of ideas floating all over the place but um, over the years I've seen that you've been able to craft excellent policy suggestions for us to debate and I would like in this case to leave it up to you and your staff to do that Council member Brooks Thank you, Mayor Story. Um, so I most certainly plan. Oh, you, yeah, I just wanted to clarify. I think I heard that as a motion from uh, oh. Councilmember Bertrand. Yeah, that was a motion. Basically, as um, City Clerk Chloe uh, introduced this discussion, are we going to move ahead with the policy development or not? And uh, my motion is basically to have city staff do that. And that would be the basis for us to discuss the policy or protocol next time we meet. And um, I do plan to be there. And um, uh, Councilwoman Brown plans to be there if, if she's healthy. And, you know, others can determine likewise. I, I have no problem. And obviously, if you're not healthy, you know, please zoom in. <laughs> yeah, let me get Is there a second to the motion? I, I just have some, I need some, a little bit more clarification on that motion, Mayor's yeah. story. Good, yeah, go ahead. Councilman. Okay, yeah. um, I, I just want to know from council, because I, I plan as well to be there in person if able, um, except for this next meeting, the very first one in person, just FYI, Mayor's story. Um, and my, my only question to council is, are we, in, if we give staff um, guidance and drafting a policy, are we in agreement that it would be the no more than three model? Um, and I think we haven't really come to that overall in terms of giving further guidance to, to staff this evening. 
So I'd be interested in hearing everyone else's input on that. And if I may, Mayor. Um, yeah. So go, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so, um, Councilman Brooks, I totally understand where you're going, and um, what I was proposing is that um, City Manager uh, Jamie Goldstein would take the things that we talked about, and one of the points is yours. And so that would be part of the discussion. So the next meeting we decide should it be three or you know four or five or you know something like that. So we determine at that point um, what it would be. And um, I have no I problem with that, actually, but I think he would provide or the city would the staff would provide a framework for us to discuss these various points, including how many people would be there. I see. Thank you, Council Member Bertrand. So what you're saying is that staff would come back with a few options right. to Council on a potential policy with all of our ideas. Yeah, because I've, I've heard a lot of ideas and I've heard a lot of potential options. And for us to go down all of those right now, I think would take a lot of time and we may not end up with the best product. But I am fully confident that Jamie and staff to come up with the options presented as I've seen before in a logical format so we could make a decision uh, piece by piece by piece and then end up with a decent policy or protocol. Council Member Brand. Thank you. Um, so I think, you know, I, it sounds like we are in agreement on quite a bit of this here. And so I think there is a possibility to come up with at least a bare bones policy tonight for the for staff to bring back to us in August. Um, and so before I move forward, I think I need to clarify um, if Council Member Bertrand, if, if your motion, is, is that died for lack of a second now or would I need to make a substitute motion? Um, no well, you would no. need to make a substitute uh, if this motion doesn't get a second. So, okay. you know, I, 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 is, let me just clarify. Is, is, is there a second to something in the Bertrand's motion? Okay, seeing none, that motion dies for the lack of a second. Okay. Yes, Council Member Brown, you're free to go ahead and make any kind of motion you'd like. Okay, thank you. Uh, I would like to make a motion um, that staff draft a, a very bare bones policy um, with the requirement that there is at least one council member and no more than three um, in person uh, in chambers as we move forward with our hybrid meeting policy um, and that council members will uh, decide um, based on their level, level of comfort, if they will be joining in person or not. Um, I think it sounds like for the most part, we have all agreed at least to that, that we need one person, there shouldn't be more than three. It doesn't make sense to me for all five of us or even four of us to go back in August and then say, for the safety and well-being of everyone, there should only be three of us here. That, that kind of defeats the purpose to me. So I would make a motion um, that we move forward with a policy requiring no more than three, but at least one uh, council member to be in person for our hybrid meetings moving forward. There's a second to that motion. Yeah, uh, council member Brown, I would like to second, but did you say something about the attendance, the public social distancing? I don't know if you wanted to add yeah, thank you for that reminder. Yes, let's add that to the policy as well, that um, there be social distancing in the public um, aspect of, of chamber. Um, I don't know if we want to decide right now if we want that to just be every other chair or if we want to go as far as the six feet of social distancing the way it, you know, that it previously was, was required, if, if council has thought on that, or if um, you know, we just want to give direction to staff right now that there should be some kind of social distancing in the chambers and then they can return to us uh, in August with information about, you know, what, what the capacity might look like in the room with different kinds of social distancing. Um, so for now, I would just say yes, I'll add to the motion that there would need to be some kind of social distancing amongst um, members of the public. And the agenda? What about? 
to add that last agenda item as a standing agenda item on who's going to show up? Did you like that? I, I like that. I'm not married to it. I think the most important part to me right now of this motion is determining how many people can be there and how many people need to be there. The rest of it about social distancing in the audience, I think, is something that we can figure out the details of when the policy comes back to us. If the rest of the council thinks it's a good idea to have a standing agenda item, um, I'm happy to put that in, in the motion. If not, I think it's also something we can just you know, tell staff that that would be a good idea to do without it having to be in our actual policy. Okay, I'd like to second Council Member Brown's um, motion of the 1-3 model um, of three council, um, no more than three and at least one council member being um, in person for our future council meetings as well as creating a social distancing um, protocol for chambers. Um, I, I'd like to second that motion. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Um, is there further discussion on that motion? Yeah, um, so there, there's quite a few items that were brought up that people felt were important. Um, but one that Sam brought up that I thought was important was um, uh, a rotation of some sort, like if we all wanted to be here, but you know, basically we're deciding one or three, um, we need some way to decide you know, who's going to rotate in and who's going to rotate out. So we're going to have to get some sort of protocol there too. Um, Councilwoman Brown, do you have a suggestion to add into that? I mean, I think that if we can ask, you know, the, uh, again, I don't think it needs to be part of the policy, but I think if we can direct staff to plan for essentially an agenda item where we ask each time who's coming next time around, I think we're all adults. And, you know, if I was at the meeting in person in August and then the next time there's four people that want to come, then I'll step back. And if there's not enough people showing up and, and I haven't been to the last couple meetings, then I will step in. I think being able to step forward when necessary and step back when necessary is something that we as adults and council members should, should be able to know how to, to handle. Um, as long as there's a place on the agenda for us to have that discussion at the end of each of our meetings, I think we're going to be fine. And I, I just want to add too quickly, I mean, I don't think, I think it's important also that we consider that we are not asking um, our fellow council members to disclose anything about their own um, personal lives, about their own health, about their own thoughts, about who they may be exposing to COVID, et cetera. So that if it seems like someone isn't coming for a certain number of meetings that we don't require them to um, justify that by perhaps disclosing information that would be otherwise kind of personal or, or something not that they wouldn't want to share. And I'm not suggesting that that's the case for anyone here, but I do know that a lot of times if people are immunocompromised or they are close to someone who's immunocompromised or they have concerns about being in close spaces right now, um, that that's not always something that is comfortable sharing with, with others. And so I do, um, I, I trust in us as a body to be able to negotiate this amongst ourselves in a way that those who want to show up in person will be able to and have the space to, and those um, that don't um, won't, won't have to, but hopefully will feel comfortable doing so at, at some point. I, I do have faith and, and trust in us to be able to navigate this kind of conversation as we move forward. And okay, any further comments? Um, well, I, I guess I just in closing, um, I just, I think wanted to recognize that, um, that there are built in, you know, um, personal practices where people can call in sick from their employment without having to disclose the reasons why. And I think that that would apply to council members as well. So it's not about um, 
requiring anyone to disclose, you know, any uh, privilege, um, you know, health information. So, um, you know, but at the same time, trying to maintain, you know, I, I think certain uh, public expectations of, of about that kind of members. But um, I think we have a start. Let's see how it goes. Um, um, and then it will maybe be an evolving process. So with that, um, can we have a roll call vote? Yes. Uh, I just want to reiterate the motion is for staff to draft kind of a basic policy, including direction given this evening, specifically including the requirement of at least one council member, but no more than three in person at the chambers and some social distancing guidelines um, protocols for the public and that that will be brought back for review on august 25th okay council member bertrand Here. council member brooks aye council member brown aye vice mayor kaiser aye and mayor story aye motion passes unanimously We'll move on now to item 8C, um, which is to amend the fiscal year 2022-23 city fee schedule. Um, the recommended action is to adopt the proposed resolution amending the fee schedule for fiscal year 2022-23. And before we begin, Thank you, Mayor. Sorry, sorry, guys. I have to recuse due to my employment at Paradise Beach Grill. The fee schedule is um, incorporated with the outdoor dining policy. So, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, give me one moment to share my screen. A couple of slides here. And for the last time, does that look okay, Larry? Looks awesome. Thank you. So as the mayor just mentioned, this last item this evening is to discuss amending the uh, fiscal year 22-23 fee schedule. Um, just by way of background, uh, reviewing and approving the fee schedule is annually as part of our um, annual budget process. And at our last meeting on June 23rd, we did adopt the fiscal year 22-23 uh, fee schedule. However, um, at that time, we did not have all of the information that we needed to um, determine what the appropriate fees, if any, would be um, regarding outdoor dining. But however, we have received final certification now from the Coastal Commission in mid-July, so we have all of that information. And um, as I just mentioned, an amendment to the fee schedule is required in order to recover costs associated with outdoor dining. Um, those proposed fee amendments, the first one on the list is a revocable encroachment permit for $230. Um, and that's based on staff time to process that permit. Uh, design permit for a custom deck is a thousand dollar deposit, and that's pretty typical for when we're doing design to build type stuff like this. Um, outdoor dining space rent, thirty four hundred dollars per parking space or partial space used, and that is derived basically by the revenue, estimated revenue that each parking space generates annually. Um, for outdoor dining in non-parking spaces and on sidewalks, that breaks down to about $18 a square foot, which is taking that $3,400 and the amount of square footage in a parking space. So that's um, on par for both. Both those, those two are equal. And then the final thing is I'm requiring a uh, maintenance deposit to ensure that the restaurants participating maintain the, their spaces up to standards. And the uh, recommendation is $500 for sidewalk and non-parking spaces, $1,000 for um, if you occupy one or two spaces, and $1,500 if you're at three to five spaces. And our recommendation this evening is to adopt the proposed resolution in the agenda packet and then the fee schedule for fiscal year 22-23. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Questions on the fee schedule? I'm seeing none. Um, Jim, I had a question. Um, 
concerning the parking spaces. This is on page 153. And um, in red, um, it says $3,400 annually for each space or partial space. Um, I think I get the concept of, you know, even if somebody has a partial space, they're taking up the parking space. Um, but if two of the parcels were to overlap and each of them is taking up a partial space, would they each pay $3,400? No, um, we would prorate that based on, if it was, for example, a 50-50 split, they would just pay half. But we would figure out the square footage that each, each occupies and apply the $18 if they were splitting a parking space like that. Okay, yeah. I don't know if you could codify that in the, in the ordinance so people know, but um, it does seem like they could each be charged um, like a full $3,400. Yeah, I, I don't think, um, unless it changes through as we go from temporary to permanent, the way it's set up right now, we don't have anyone sharing. I don't think we have anyone using partial spaces. I think we have some non. But they, this kind of came about as somebody tried to suggest a cutting into a space to draw a straight line for their dining area and they lose that space. But um, there are opportunities, I think, especially on San Jose, where they could combine those and possibly share that cost. Right, okay. I think it would be good to affirm that with them and so they know that they can maybe, you know, save on their cost. Um, but that was my only question, Jim. Um, I'm seeing no other questions. I'll go out to the public now. Um, let's see if there's if any member of the public wishes to address the council. Raise your hand in Zoom. Um, or you could uh, call in by Dialing star nine. Mayor Story, I do not see any attendees with their hands raised for this item, and we have not received any email on this item. Okay. Um, with that, I'll, I'll close the public comment portion of the meeting. I'll bring it back for council for um, further deliberation and action. Somebody wish to make a motion? Council Member Brown. Yeah, I'd like to move that we adopt the proposed resolution amending the fee schedule for fiscal year 22-23. There's a second. Second. Okay. We have a motion by Council Member Brown, seconded by Council Member Brooks. Uh, so we have a roll call vote. Councilmember Bertrand. I agree. Councilmember Brooks. Aye. Councilmember Brown. Aye. Mayor Story. Aye. Uh, that motion passes unanimously. Thank you. We've got the item 10 adjournment. Um, so uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, staff, uh, for your good work this evening. Uh, I am going to adjourn this meeting uh, until our next uh, scheduled meeting on August the 25th, um, which will be in person at the uh, City Hall Chambers. Um, and, um, and we will see everyone there in some either in person or in Zoom uh, as is the hybrid meeting. Um, and uh, Larry, farewell. Um, we will miss you. Um, and to everyone else, um, be kind to yourself and then pass it on to everyone you meet. All right. Good night, everyone. Bye, Larry. Mm -hmm. Goodbye.